Throughout the course of human history, most men and women have lived under a state of tyranny and oppression. Freedom is the exception to that. But freedom comes with a cost, and it's been paid in blood by those whose names are inscribed behind us here in black granite at the Jacksonville Veterans Memorial Wall. These soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines paid the highest price for our freedom. Yet each also leaves behind a family known as Gold Star Families to grieve their tragic loss. Two members of these families work with us every day at Fleet Readiness Center Southeast. In our first segment, we'll speak with the mother of U.S. Army Sergeant Jonathan Hartman, who lost his life in Iraq in 2004. If you will, tell me a little bit about Jonathan, just what kind of a person he was. Um, what kind of personality did he have? Was he outgoing? I saw a few pictures of him with a guitar and drums and that sort of thing. Was he into the music or? He, loved, he taught himself to play the guitar. Really? What uh, age was he about when that happened? An older teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a funny thing. Mm -hmm. Jonathan was very smart. Uh, in some of the standardized testing, he scored in the top 1% in the nation. But he would go to school and, and not be tested at, um, intellectually. Mm -hmm. So we struggled with him going to school and staying in school. And sometimes I was very successful and sometimes I was not as successful. So, but he loved music. Um, he loved taking pictures. He did that in the Army. He was almost like uh, a PAO plus um, an armor guy really? and everything else. Uh -huh. he, like most young men, he played baseball played football, uh, helped with soccer, loved pretty girls. Uh, he, he was very much like a lot of young men who are in the military right now. Okay. So what was his childhood like? You were working up at Norfolk at the time, right? Right. Is that where he went to school and grew up for yes. the most part? Yes, he was born in Portsmouth. Uh, I was a single parent. Um, I have a line where I say that Jonathan was an only child, but he had hundreds of brothers and sisters. And people would look at me like, they'll see, he has a Facebook page now, a memorial Facebook page that one of his friends created. And so you'll see posts on there where people call, them, call him their brother. And people say, well, I didn't know you had more children. And I'm going like, and I kind of, at first I kind of thought, well, how do I explain this? And then I just kind of laughed and I said, because Jonathan treated everyone as if they were family. Um, we have a line, sometimes Dan will say to me, have you ever met a stranger? And I'll go, well, not really. Because, you know, I say hello to people and I try to be kind to people and respectful. And, and we don't always know exactly how much of our everyday life we're imparting to other people, to our children. Mm -hmm. But I can see now that the lessons he learned all through his life, he carried into his young adult and adulthood. Um, the, some of the ladies who were his babysitter, one in particular had four boys. And so Jonathan was their brother. They, they played with him, they horsed with him. They were just as rough and tumble with him as they were with, with, their, with each other. Right. Uh, and one of my other friends had, had little girls. So mm -hmm. he had sisters growing up too. So he did not um, ever miss not having a big family. I, I had, there were eight of us growing up, so we had a big family, right. but he had his own big family. And mm -hmm. then of course, once he was in the army, those, those men to this day love him fiercely and, and still call him brother and, and write remembrances and say, I will never forget you brother. And that means a lot. Now was, how old was he when you made the move from Virginia down to Orange Park and came to work here? It would have been close to 20 because that was in, in I moved down in February of 96. So he was born in 76. He was a bicentennial baby. So by that time he was working uh, at different places. As a matter of fact, he was working at Olive Garden at the time. So he was able to come down here and get a job with Olive Garden uh, and work just down the street from the house. How was that transition for him? 
at that age. I suppose it was probably a little easier since he was out of school. But right. uh, coming here, I assume he didn't really know anyone when he, he got here. He didn't know anybody, but he made friends, uh, friends at work, uh, and just you know, just like everyone else, you know, you, your circle starts small and you just start expanding it. But uh, basically, he came to realize that no matter what he was doing, he always had wanted to fly. Uh, but Jonathan didn't finish high school. He only had a GED. So he, he, he wanted, to, in order to take flying lessons, it's very expensive. So he realized that an easy, a, not an easy way, one way to learn how to fly is through the military because the military will pay for your training and give you experience. But the only military service that he could go to because he only had a GED was the Army. So I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but he started talking to recruiters and found out this information. And so I said, well, you, and I, you know, by that time he was an adult, so I wasn't going to try to tell him what to do, but I just said, you need to be very careful of the decisions you make. So he decided to join the Army. I was going to ask you about that, how uh, if he consulted you or not before embarking on that, or if um, you know, did did he ever you know, ask you? Or I assume he listened if you told him uh, what you thought about that. Well, even in dangerous times, I knew that the army would be uh, the military would be something that would be beneficial to him as far as the skills that he would learn, the discipline that he would learn. Uh, the friendships that he would make. Uh, nobody wants to think about bad things happening uh, because you could drive down the road and have an accident. Um, so you don't think of you, my my child's going out for an evening with buddies. You know, you you hope that they'll all come home safely, just like we send our young men and young women out to protect us all over the world. And we hope that they'll come back, and most of them come back fine. Uh, so you just uh, put your hope and your faith in God and, and go. So was he planning on being a warrant officer at some point and transitioning yes. from that yes. when he had a little time in? Yes, he went to basic training at Fort Knox, which was nice because it was my family lives in Ohio. So uh, many of them were able to come to his graduation. And I know, I know that meant a lot to him uh, to have family there. And then we went back to Ohio and. He had kind of a little reception there with the ones who couldn't come. And so we have pictures of him holding his nieces when they were babies and they're now in their 20s and, and graduated from college or going to college. So um, it's just funny when you look back on pictures because as an adult, we all look the same. But where you really see the time pass is when you see small children who were two or three or less and being held in the arms and now they're adults and you realize that almost a lifetime has passed, not a generation, but they have grown from children to adulthood and never knew him because he was gone. And that was what, year 98? <laughs> Somewhere right around Somewhere there. around there, I'd have to actually look. Sorry. No, that's okay. All right, so you said he went to basic in Fort Knox um, did he go to AIT, the tank training school and everything there as well? Yes. Oh, and do you know what got him into tanks and wanting to go that route? Okay, this is because it's, uh, armor is such an exclusively male, combat, uh, combat is exclusively male that there were better chances of advancement. Now, I don't know if that's what he was told or if that's the truth. I never talked to anyone to find out is that really the real or is whatever. But that's that was his decision. Yes. Okay. And and besides, a 7010 tank. I mean, that's got to be the safest thing in the world, the right? Abrams probably. So I would assume. It felt pretty safe. How did he go get along in army life? Uh, did he I know some, a lot of guys go through struggles during basic or, or boot camp and, and kind of question their decision. Um, did, he, did he seem to adjust okay? But for, for many people, of course, it's a, it's a harsh reality when you go from being completely 
free and making your own decisions to enlisting, especially in a combat arms MOS in the military and having that, that strict discipline, did he seem to adjust okay? I, I believe so. He never, never had any indication that he had second thoughts. Uh, but he went right from basic training and his that training, he went straight to Germany. So that probably was the biggest change for him. He didn't just join the army, he went to another country. And he fell in love with that. He loved being, not that he didn't love America, but he loved being in Germany because he could hop on the train and go to other countries. He could, everything about being in the army in Germany was good for him. He got to know people, um, guys even to this day that will talk about knowing him in Germany and how, how he really loved it uh, and how he helped them, helped them learn and helped them become the soldier that they are or the man that they are today. One of the things he would he said was funny, he would go to a restaurant and you'd sit down and you'd everybody, you, the table would fill up. You weren't sitting at a table by yourself. It was family style and you got to know people and people would bring their dogs in and sit under the table. Um, so it was just, it was very different than life in the United States. So 1st Armored Division was stationed there? In Friedberg. That, okay. Did your involvement with aviation, did that, do you think that had anything to do with him having a will to fly, did that, you know, did you take him to air shows? Oh, or we always went to air shows, uh -huh. I mean, all the time. And I remember one time he, he tried, he tried to go over and tell the people in the, uh, in the tower that, that he was from, <laughs> from our command and he had permission to go up in the tower. I'm going like, oh gosh, it's a wonder he wasn't put in jail. How old was he at that oh, time? Oh, it's probably 15, 16, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to see what I can get away with. It wasn't hurting anybody. You know, it wasn't really anything against the law, but I want to be up as close and personal as I can to where the action is. I think that's what he wanted to be so close. And of course, the, the air shows in, in Virginia are huge because that's uh, part of the Azalea Festival. So it's an international air show and they have uh, lots of planes that uh, do their the exhibits. And I remember it was amazing to see the big bombers and how the bombers would be just as static displays. And you could see the wind come by and the, the wings would, would just go up and down. Very, and he's going, how can something like that, that big, with the wings that move like that, how can that fly? And so he was, he loved the concept of flying. Right. So whether I helped to inspire that, I have no idea, but I'll take that right. sure. <laughs> as a plus. Right. Well, that's not odd, I don't think at all, for a boy. I know I had my own fascination with him, of course, when I was a little boy as well. So so it, he had been in a couple years by the time 9-11 came around. What were your feelings, I'm sure, as a mother having a child in not only the military, but in combat arms that that time was probably uh, especially significant for you. Did any of those thoughts cross your mind when that day happened in the resulting couple of weeks? Um, you know, was there concern there on your part or how, how was that for you? I suppose that you could say that I was rather naive about what people actually do in the Army. Um, I figure since he was a tanker, that's all he did was ride around in his tank. So even, and, and he wanted to go to Iraq. They want to go there. They want to be where the action is. And he was almost, uh, they brought guys from the United States over first. And so the, the guys in Europe weren't being rotated uh, at first. And he was thinking, this thing's gonna be over before I even get a chance to get in there with the action. So he was excited to go. And I thought, oh, he's in a tank what could happen? You know, he's perfectly safe. Not realizing that the tanks were too big to really patrol many of the towns and cities. So they were on foot patrols. If I would have known all of that, um, I would have probably had much more apprehension. But again, he was an adult. This is a decision. 
We had entrusted him to God's care and keeping, and I had to trust because if you don't, if I didn't trust, then every night I would be so worried that I would not be able to even think or function myself. How was your, I know by the time we got there in early 2007, there was some infrastructure a little bit set up as far as the U.S. military bases. How was your contact with him while he was deployed? Did you did you get to speak with him on the phone much or is it just pretty much strictly letters? Or He would call me here at work because of the Audubon system and he could talk to me, I'd probably talk to him about once a week and email uh, and then of course letters. Right. So it was, it was great to actually be able to hear his voice. It wasn't like he was thousands of miles away. It was like he was right there. Right. Now, I, I know of, of many times sons try to keep certain information away from their family. They don't want them to worry or be too scared or anything like that. But do you remember any of what he told you as far as his experiences um, and the time he was there of, of what he saw if he, you know, You mean as far as like danger or bad well, things? Well, anything or, or helping or, you know, if they thought they were, if he, it, because I know sometimes you handed soccer balls out to little kids right. and some days you were, you well, were dodging other things. Yeah, I know, I know that some of the conditions that they had to live in were, were not the best. And, and at the time they didn't have a lot of um, places to go to get things. So he would call me and I would go down to Camp Blanding, down to their exchange and get him uniforms and get his badge, his ribbon made up with his name and, and send him things. Uh, Count Chocula is, was one of his favorite cereals. And I got to know the people, the guys at the post office very well. I would send him, you know, he'd have a list of what he needed and I would go shopping and send them to him. So. You know what? What all they were used for? I know that he, you know, probably, uh, you know, he, he shared with his buddies. They would all do that. Certainly. Uh, I remember uh, it was funny. One day he was calling me from Germany. It was before he was deployed, and I said, "I said, well, what are you doing?" It was a Saturday morning. He says, "What are you doing?" He said, "Oh, I'm cooking calamari." You're doing what? He's cooking calamari. He, uh, as a when he was a cook at Olive Garden, he had learned how to cook all those mm -hmm. kind of things, and so the the guys could not believe it. He had gone to the exchange, found some frozen calamari, and come back, and he was in his barracks cooking up calamari wow. on a Saturday morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, I've read a little bit about uh, the what happened um, from the Stars and Stripes article. First of all, how how were you notified um, that your son had passed away? It was a Sunday. I had gone to church, had lunch, come home, and uh, was sitting in the house and I saw the car across the street. Didn't think a whole lot about it because a lot of cars on the street. And the uh, gentleman came to the door and as soon as I saw him at the door I knew because you don't have a military person come to the door in uniform um, just to say, hello, how are you today? And so I invited him in, he sat me down, and he told me that Jonathan had been killed. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he gave me some, some brief details and some information and said that they would be, the Army would be contacting me. It was somebody from Fort Stewart, because that was the closest large military installation. So then I thanked him very much. He said, is there anybody I need to contact for you? And I said, no, I'll be, I'll be fine. And so then I started calling people. I called my boss, Nancy Crook, was the public affairs officer here. Well, then she started calling people. And then I started calling my family in Ohio because my sister had just moved into a, a house the day before. And they were all together um, celebrating her move in. So I was able to make one phone call and, and contact almost everyone, all my family members in Ohio. And later that afternoon, the RCO, Captain Beck, and his wife, who had just returned from vacation, uh, came by. He had his summer whites on and she had her dress on and, 
uh, you know, friends from church came over, and it's just kind of uh, started snowballing from there. But I was able to come to work. I came to work the next day, and we started working on my next mission, which was the message that we wanted to put out to the American people about Jonathan. That Jonathan loved this country, he loved the Lord, he loved what he was doing, and he he did what he wanted to do. So I was not going to blame anyone for his death. Was it a uh, was it a chaplain that showed up at your showed up at your door? No, I don't believe so. I think no. it was just a regular staff person. Gotcha. Okay. So. And you said that they gave you some information, but um, eventually a CACO came down and and talked. And what is that? A casualty assistance officer. In my small group from church, we had three gentlemen who were retired military. Two of them had been casualty assistance officers. So when the casualty assistance officer came to meet me at my house, they were there also because they knew some questions that he may that I may have that he may not think I need to know all the information. So they were there as also my interface with the Army to make sure that all all the information was, was good so that, um, because when you're in a situation like that, your mind is, it's like going to the doctor when you have cancer. You need somebody there as your advocate because you can't hear all the words. All you hear is cancer or die. You don't hear that on this day, this is going to happen. On this day, you're going to go for treatment. On this day, we need to have you over here. So when, when you go to a doctor and you're seriously ill, you need to have someone there with you. Well, that's what they were doing with me. They knew that this situation was so overwhelming, even though I didn't think I was overwhelmed at the time, that there were so many factors involved and so many things that would have to come together that I, I needed somebody there with me to make sure that I knew what to do and when to do it. And they did that for and you? And they did that for yeah. me. Jonathan was killed in Iraq. His body was taken to Germany. They had to process that. Then they had to bring it to Cincinnati because I had him buried uh, near where my family lives. It's a small community in Waynesville, which is between Dayton and Cincinnati. So it wasn't like uh, if it would have been local, then the the all the issues would have been much simpler. Yes, ma'am. But the nice thing was, because he was buried in Ohio, there were a lot of his buddies that um, were stationed back at Fort Knox. So they were a whole, two bands of them were able to come up and be able to be part of his funeral and able to pay their respects. So it was, it was a great to finally meet them under terrible conditions, but it was nice that they were able to be there. Did he have a friend escort? Did they have a, a buddy escort the, the yes, body back but home? I'm not sure who that is. I mean, I d- didn't write that down. I was hoping it was going to be the, his best buddy, but Chad's wife was expecting their first child, and he wasn't sure. I mean, he had responsibility there, even though he loved Jonathan. And I said, "Oh no, no, I understand. You take care of Kim. That's your that's your first responsibility." And, but he, she ended up having the child, so he was able to come up for the funeral. And you, as to the best of your knowledge, what happened that day in Day One Year? They were, they had been replaced. Their unit had been replaced. He had called me the Friday before and said, "Mom, we've been extended for 90 days because of of the." Um, insurgencies and, and just to, to keep them there. So because they had already been replaced in that base, they were sending them to another base. So when you take an Abrams tank, you, you don't want to, they only get like eight or nine miles, maybe not even six miles to a gallon. So you can't send them uh, on, down the road. They are actually put on uh, flatbed trucks that are bigger than, oh, it's a, they have a special name for it. Like a deuce and a half? I don't know. But it's bigger than a flatbed okay. tractor trailer. Mm-hmm. I think in that article they call it HTT or H- HHT, heavy heavy transport, whatever. Okay. So they put the, the tanks on the heavy transports uh, and move them from Baghdad down to their, uh, was it Najaf or Medved? 
it's in the article, sorry. I don't remember all the sure. names that are hard to pronounce. So, but it's, as is true of anything, you don't have a military move. There's no secret when you're moving a convoy of that size because each tank was on, on its own truck. I'm not sure how many tanks were involved, but uh, they started to go through a town and uh, something had was blocking the road. So they had to go a different way. And the road that they went down was where the ambush was set up. So um, when the ambush first happened, the, there was a gentleman in the first Jeep. He was killed. And so that stopped the convoy. And then Jonathan was in the lead tank in the CO's position, and he was shot. And then one, there was a scout that was near the end, and he, he was killed. I, I never found out how many were wounded in that attack, but those were the only three that were killed. So the tanks were on the trucks, but the guys were inside the tanks. Right. So when they, re were, when they took fire, they were able to return fire. And um, they went to an area, and this is all kind of the military stuff where they're taught, you know, you, 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 when you're under attack, you go over here and you get together and you find out where everybody is and what's their status. Well, they were still on the trucks. And the tanks didn't even, the tank guys didn't even wait for them to unchock, unchain them. They broke their chains and went back in and fought. And they said it was like a five hour firefight. So it wasn't just a, a little ambush and they went on down the road. It was, it was a huge battle. So I'm, I'm thankful to all those guys for doing the job they did because I was able to have Jonathan come home. And that was, uh, he had a closed casket but I wanted to see him. So I was able to see him, and he had a tattoo on his leg. So I said, I want to see his tattoo. Uh, it's, and it, that was able to give me a lot of peace. Right. And you've been able since then to talk to some of those guys that were with him when that yes. happened? A friend of his had started a Facebook page. And so uh, it was the funeral home did memorial videos, did two memorial videos for me. And so one of them is his younger years. And we used the Josh Groban song, To Be Where You Are. And then we did another one uh, using Celine Dion's God Bless America with his adult years and going into the army. So uh, posted those on his Facebook page and his birthday's in November and then he was killed in April. So on those anniversaries, uh, his friends post on Facebook just like they would be sending him a birthday message mm -hmm. and uh, it's very comforting to see that. Now you mentioned that when everything initially happened that you would you couldn't hear everything that was being said or you had you thought you were okay. Um, at what point do you think it really sunk it, it sunk in that he's he's not coming home that he's he's no longer deployed but He's gone. Probably sometime between the time I was notified and the time that I actually saw him. I mean, I knew he was gone, but he had made a decision when he was a young man, asked the Lord to forgive him for his sins, and of course didn't live a perfect life, but he lived a life of love and friendship. So I knew that the Lord was taking care of him. There was, there was a great peace in knowing that. How is Memorial Day now for you? Does it seem to get easier every year or does it, is it continue to be painful when it comes around? Or? It's a remembrance. Uh, it's like I remember when I was a kid, you know, that's when you had a cookout, you know, you play games, that's when summer started. Uh, when school was almost out and you know we we knew about Memorial Day but it wasn't personal um, now it's personal and so every year we try to go someplace uh, either downtown Jacksonville we've been going to Green Cove Springs 
on Memorial Day and, and be a part of that celebration. I remember after his funeral, we stopped at a little convenience store and got some newspapers to get some copies of his obituary and things. And I, I was thinking, the world should just stop. You should stop. You shouldn't be laughing and, and buying things. You shouldn't be working. You should stop for just a moment and realize that a great man is gone. So I guess that's kind of what I think of on Memorial Day now. We can have fun, we can cook out, we can go to the beach, we can do a lot of things, but sometime during that day we should just stop and remember that great men and women are gone, that they're not with us anymore because they gave their life for this country. You did mention you were uh, you were working here at the time. Um, how did that how did that go for you here, it, and how do you think that might have differed than working somewhere out in the civilian sector? Working here was like having three thousand people in my family. People did things that I was, I could not believe. Everybody was doing whatever they could to support me. My friends in PAO helped me write the right, right words. Um, you know, get, do, scan a picture. Uh, my other, other friends in, helped to videotape his memorial service, so I'd have that to remember. Uh, it was funny, it, not funny, ha ha, but we're all picture takers in my family. And I remember we were riding down the road and uh, I was riding with my sister and she was an elementary school principal. Her boss had all the children come out, dressed in their red, white, and blue, come out to the, to the curb and hold flags and posters, remembering, thanking Jonathan for his sacrifice. And I remember rolling down the window and leaning out and taking pictures of those children and those posters because I wanted to remember. I knew that I would forget that if there was so much going on, I wouldn't be able to remember everything, but I wanted to be able to remember the pictures of those, of those children. And that's kind of what the people here did. There were a group of managers that got together and they paid to have his uniforms put in shadow boxes. Uh, there were carpenters here that, that made the shadow boxes for them to be put in. So everybody did anything they could to let me know that, hey, we love you. We love Jonathan. We appreciate his sacrifice. We will never forget you. We will never forget him. So Judy, where is Jonathan laid to rest at? He is laid to rest in Ohio. It's a little community in Warren County. It's part of Waynesville. It's off the side of Waynesville. It's called Corwin. We had the opportunity for him to have been buried in Washington, D.C., but I wanted him buried close to the family, someplace that I would go every year, and I could come by every year and pay respects. So um, come to find out that that little cemetery has a veterans section. So there he is, all with his, all the rest of the veterans, and what's overlooking and protecting them is an old tank. So there he is with an old tank and his brothers and sisters in arms. Seems appropriate, doesn't it? Yes. I guess finally, Judy, I wanted to ask you what, what you miss most about your son. I'm sure being an only child, that relationship was special. Um, that he and yourself had. What do you miss the most about him? His smile. His little orneriness. You know how as a little boy, people come up, they'll go up behind you, and when you get your picture taken, and do the little bunny ears. Well, that's what he would do. He would get up behind my mother and do bunny ears for her birthday. And so we can look back through the scrapbook that my sister-in-law did and you see all these occasions where she thought that she was getting a great picture taken and there's Jonathan with his bunny ears right behind grandma so his smile his personality the way he loved intensely I miss it all